Okay. Okay, today we'll be going over chapter seven, the cellular basis for the inheritance. So all organisms possess the ability to reproduce offsprings in kind. There's a hippopotamus. These are Monterey pine trees. There's a flamingo with a baby flamingo. So the parent is the organism that contributes the genes to an offspring via gametes. And the meiosis forms the haploid gametes from each parent that fuses to form the diploid embryo. And then mitosis leads to the adult organism. And the variation in offsprings is a key component of sexual reproduction in most eukaryotic organisms. Let me just pause really quick here. Okay, so yeah, the variation in offspring is the key component of the reproduction in most eukaryotic organisms. So what is sexual reproduction? It's only mainly for uh, many animals for many animals is the only mode of reproduction. It has certain disadvantages compared to asexual reproduction because its disadvantages of sexual reproduction are asexual reproduction advantages. And uh, why is it better or why is it more efficient? Because there is no need to locate the opposite sex. There's no energy finding, energy spent on finding or attracting the male. There's no need for males. <laughs> and the population can be twice as large. So the competitive advantage over sexual, uh, sexual population on resources, because there are more of them, which is, and this is exceedingly rare in animals. So why is uh, then sexual reproduction so common? because it produces variation in offsprings. And that is quite important for the survival of the offsprings. And the survival of the offsprings is important for success of the species. And only source of variation in asexual organism is the mutation, the DNA. But sexual organisms can create variations from mutation as well as reorganization of the genes. And also on top of that, Meiosis can be used in making haploid gametes, um, increase variation in the offsprings. We'll talk about this uh, later. And this happens in pro-metaphase of the meiosis, meiosis one. Prophase and uh, metaphase of meiosis one through the process of crossing over and independent absorption. But we'll talk more of that. <laughs> so, life cycles of sexually reproducing, reproducing organisms. Fertilization and meiosis alternate in sexual life cycles. But the meiosis has the genome content and the fertilization doubles the genome content. So there are three types of life cycles, diploid dominant, haploid dominant, and alteration of generations. Haploid Diploid dominant are people, are humans like us. And haploid dominants are things like fungi seen here. So the, this diagram is a little small and it's hard to uh, fit them only in one slide, but it's, uh, you can see it in the lecture file, slide file better, but we'll just briefly talk about this anyway. And then there's the uh, uh, organisms like plants, they alternate between haploid dominant and diploid dominant stages. So let's talk about this a little more in detail. So multicellular cellular, uh, diploid stage is the most obvious life stage. There's no multicellular haploid stage. Um, most animals, including humans, are diploid dominant. And only haploid cells are the gametes made from germline cells. And haploids, 
or gametes lose the ability to divide. They have to be fertilized in order to divide. There's no such thing as multicellular haploid stage for the diploid dominant organisms. What about haploid dominant organisms? Most of fungi and algae tend to be haploid dominant. The multicellular body of the organism is haploid. And the spe uh, specialized haploid cells from two individuals can join to form a diploid zygote. But zygote immediately undergoes meiosis to produce spores. So here's the uh, spores. Spores uh, develop, go through meiosis and develop into these structures called hypha. And these hypha, hypha are divided into plus mate, mating types and negative mating types. And then they uh, combine and go through nuclear fusion and that becomes the diploid zygote. And is the uh, diploid zygote here. And that immediately goes through meiosis and produces more spores. What about alteration of generations? Uh, all plants and some algae have this form. They have both diploid and haploid organisms. And the haploid multicellular plants are things like gametophytes. They produce gametes, but need no meiosis. Why is that? Because they are already haploid. <clears throat> all they have to go through is mitosis and produce more of it. Uh, fertilization of these gametes is what produces a diploid zygote. And so here's here's the uh, haploid stage. It starts with spores germinating. Then they become the gametophytes. And these gametophytes produce the egg and sperms. And they fertilize and they form 2N or diploid zygote. And these go through mitosis and form what is known as sporophyte. We'll talk about that next. So the zygote divides to become a diploid multicellular plant called sporophyte. Sporophyte is seen here. By the looks of the leaves, obviously these are ferns. And the flowering plants of the body are the sporophytes mostly. Uh, special, specialized cells on, of the sporophytes will undergo meiosis and produce haploid spores. And these are the underside of the leaves that will go through meiosis and produce haploid spores, and which will germinate again, and again produce the gametophytes. And the cycle repeats. So sexual reproduction requires fertilization of two gametes, and the gamete has to be produced. Right? And that process is called meiosis. And each gamete has to have one set of full chromosomes. And the number of sets of chromosomes is called diploidy. So the haploid, one end, it only has one set of the complete chromosomes. Diploid, two end, it has two sets. Diploids must produce the haploid gametes. Otherwise, the progen progenies will be tetraploid. An uh, example of tetraploid organism is Xenopus, which is a 4N ploidy frog. And meiosis, like mitosis, divides the nucleus and genome along with it. Mitos mitosis produces daughter cells, daughter nuclei that are genetically identical to the parental nucleus. Whereas meiosis produces daughter nuclei that has that have the half the genetic material as apparent. Um, most animals and plants are diploids or have two sets of the chromosomes. Homolog chromosomes are the matched pair of chromosomes inherited from each parents. Karyotypes, hypotonic, how do we know where have we seen this homolog chromosomes lined up in karyotype pictures in previous lectures? How do we produce those uh, karyotypes? You use colchicin and hypotonic solution to rupture the cells. Um, same genes are located at the same, uh, same genes are at the same locations on the homolog chromosomes. 
And during meiosis, these homologues have to be separated. In mitosis, sister chromatids are separated. But in, in meiosis, both the homologues and chromatids must be separated. So in meiosis, DNA duplicates once, but separates twice. So it goes from 2N to 4N to 2N to 1N. And at 4N stage, there are 92 chromosomes in one single cell. And the stages of divisions are analogous to uh, mitosis. Uh, two rounds of division in meiosis is differentiated by 1 and 2. So let's go through some phases of meiosis. Interphase, obviously, G1, S, G2, just as in mitosis. Same, uh, G1 is the cell growth. S synthesis is the replication of DNA to become foreign. G2 is the final preparation for the meiosis. And the chromatids are held together by the centromere until meiosis two. So in meiosis one, what separates are the homolog chromosomes. In animal cells, centrosomes and microtubules, mitotic, mitotic spindles also replicate uh, prior to meiosis one, which is located here. So meiosis one in prophase one, uh, it, meiosis 1 consists of prophase 1, prometaphase 1, metaphase 1, anaphase 1, telophase 1. In prophase 1, a tight pairing of chromosome called synapsis forms. And in synapsis, genes are precisely aligned next to each other on the homolog chromosomes. Remember, homologs are one parent, uh, one chromosome from mom and one chromosome from dad. And the genes on those chromosomes are precisely aligned. And this is when the crossing over can occur between homolog chromosomes. So what is a crossing over? Crossing over occurs when chiasmata forms. And that's the location where homolog exchange the chromosome uh, material, segments. And crossing over is occurring here. <clears throat> And the exchange of chromosome is called the crossing over. So homolog chromosome pairs are called the tetrads. It's tetrad because one, two, three, four chromatids are lined up next to each other. So it's tetrad. And suppose you have these uh, letters of genes on here. And if this crossing over occurs, note how the letters change because these are different alleles. They're different alleles because they came from uh, mom or dad, mom and dad. So if this blue chromosome was initially from mom and if red chromosome was initially from dad, this chromatids, these two chromatids, contain DNA, gen genetic material from both mom and dad and dad and mom. And this is what creates the first of the genetic variation produced by meiosis. <clears throat> so the rec uh, recall those uh, recombined crossed over chromatids, recombinant chromatids, sister chromatids. So they carry new combination of the trade that didn't exist before. Um, by the way, the recombination mechanism is what is used to produce knockouts and transgenic mice. Uh, GFPs and uh, mitochondria. Um, you know what? Uh, let's let's not let's not discuss that right now. So there are there are four total possibilities of traits based on a single recombination. So we'll see that here. ABC. That's the parental. Small uh, lowercase ABC. That's the uh, another the other uh, parental. So here's parental strand parental uh, chromatids, and then recomb recombinant chromatids are big A, big B, little c, little a, little b, big c, which are located here and here and shown here as a, a picture. <clears throat> um, 
So this is, uh, again, another source of genetic diversity. And each of these uh, tetrads attached to the microtubules from two poles of uh, two poles at the uh, kinetochore. Kinetochore is this yellow structure here. And then at the metaphase one, the homologs, homolog chromosomes, line up at the metaplate one, or just the metaplate. They line up at the middle. But they line up at the middle at random. In other words, one scenario can have blue on the left and red on the right, or you can have red on the left, blue on the right. And how this occurs is completely random. And the order, uh, so that we say that the order of homolog pairs on the meta plate is determined randomly. And this randomness is what results in independent assortment. And independent assortment is what generates the second form of genetic variation. And it happens only in meta plays or meta phase one, whereas crossover only happens in prophase one. So 23 pairs of chromosomes assort independently. So what would that mean? That means maternal set of 23 pairs with paternal set of 23. So at the metaplate and microtubules will attach to each homolog separately. And the orientation of tetrad tetrads can differ for each pair. Maternal can be on the left versus on the right for each chromosome. So each uh, tetrad, each homolog pair, there are two possible orientation, meaning mater maternal one on the left, paternal on the, on the right, or paternal on the left, maternal on the left, right. So then possible number of orientation combination is two raised to power of 23 because there are 23 possible combinate of 23 chromosomes which means there are over 8.38 million and this is possible this excludes crossover effects so it's which which means it's highly unlikely any two haploids will be genetically identical. And in this case, what we're talking about here is eggs and sperms. Haploid cells for humans are eggs and sperms. So no two haploid, or it's highly, highly unlikely that any two haploids will be genetically identical. So maternal and paternal genes, uh, so we'll talk about this uh, summary briefly. Let's, Maternal and paternal genes recombine by crossover occurring at the prophase one. And the random assortment of metaphase one creates combination, unique combination of maternal and paternal chromosomes. And figure two here shows uh, two chromosome sets. Here's set one, here's set two. And note blue on the left, red on the right. And this is a scenario two, same blue and the red chromosome pairs, but the here blue is on the left and here red is on the left. This is the independent assortment. And, and that tells you that there are four uh, different gametes that are possible from that. And monosis one's anaphase, telophase, and cytokinesis. Anaphase one homologs are separated, but sister chromatids stay together, which is different from mitosis because mitosis separates the uh, chromatids. And the chiasma or crossovers, connections are broken apart at this stage. So homolog with new genes from the other homolog are created, separated, or uh, uh, yeah, create, uh, separated. Telophase one, uh, homologs arrive at the opposite ends 
towards the uh, centrosomes. And then cytokinesis happens. You know, it separates the cytoplasm without reforming the nucleus. This is the main difference between cytokinesis in meiosis one versus mitosis versus mitosis. And cell plates form. And, it, and at this point, each cell only has one set of chromosomes, one N. But two N content of the DNA because sister chromatids are no longer identical due to crossovers. Or, or two N content of DNA because the, the, the homologs are separated, but there are still sister chromatids and, the, uh, and those chromatids are no longer identical due to crossovers. And then from then on, mitos, meiosis two proceeds. Sister chromatids from meiosis one will be split into form four haploid cells eventually. And in some species, cells enter another interface or interkinesis without the synthesis phase. There's no additional DNA replication but it just goes through the growth period. And, but these interface cells will enter meiosis two in, in a synchrony. They're synchronized. They're all in the same phase. So mitosis two, meiosis two, prophase, prometaphase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, and cyto, uh, cytokinesis, at this point is very similar to what happens in uh, mitochondria mitosis, which is shown here. At this point, what you're separating are the sister chromatids. So at prophase two, chromosomes condense again, new spin spindle fibers form. And then uh, prometaphase two, sister chromatids are attached to the kinetic core. Sister uh, metaphase two, sister chromatids align in the center at the metaplate. At this point, only the crossover have effects on gene genetic diversity, unlike the metaphase one. And anaphase two, the sister chromatids are separated. And at this point, and, uh, and the telophase two chromosome decondenses, cytokinesis separates two cells into four, set, four gametes. And at that point, it is one end, only has one end content of the DNA. So briefly comparing meiosis with mitosis. Meiosis, two nuclear divisions, four daughter cells, genetically unique cells, and haploid daughter cell. And the mitosis has only has one nuclear division, has two daughter cells, genetically ident identical cells, and diploid daughter cells. And this diagram summarizes what we have gone through rather, rather effectively. So variations in meiosis. <clears throat> so inherited disorders can arise when chromosomes behave anomaly, abnormally during meiosis. So there are two categories of chromosomal disorders, abnormalities and chromosomal number or chromosomal structural rearrangements. And because even the small, even small segments can spend many, many genes, chromosomal disorders are often dramatic and fatal. <clears throat> so disorders in chromosome numbers, uh, <clears throat> cytogenetics, um, isolation and microscopic observation of chromosome is what cytogenetics is. Well, which, uh, we, uh, that's not, discuss this. We have talked about it already. Uh, yeah. uh, and this is the primary method by which clinicians detect chromosomal abnormalities in humans. So a clinician will take a sample of cells. I guess we have to discuss this. Make the cells divide and arrest them at mitosis using uh, colchicine and then use hypotonic solution to rupture the cells, take a, pic take a picture of all the chromosomes and arrange them in size. <clears throat>
from biggest to smallest. And once you do that, you have the karyotype. Karyotype is the number and the appearance of chromosomes, including their length, banding pattern, and centromere uh, positions. Um, if, this, uh, if the chromosomal number is not only two, then you get these very various diseases like Down syndrome, which has three copies of chromosome 21, which is this guy here. And the Turner syndrome only has one X <clears throat> and uh, it's a female. And Jacobson syndrome actually has deletion, entire deletion of chromosome 11. And uh, often, sometimes you get translocation uh, of uh, chromosome sections in some cancers. So non-disjunction, duplication, and deletions are also other abnormalities that can occur with, uh, or which is what underlies the chromosomal disorders. So disorder of chromosomal number includes duplication or loss of entire chromosomes. And that requires this event called non-disjunction that occurs when pair of homolog chromosomes or sister chromatids fail to separate during meiosis. And we'll go over why this is the case. Here's meiosis one. Here, non-disjunction occurred, meaning non-separation occurred in meiosis one. So the, this daughter cell has the proper number of chromosomes, but this daughter cell has two blue and one red because red didn't separate properly. So you end up with N plus one content of chromosomes. And the risk of non disjunct this event happening, increases with age of the parents, age of the mother. Uh, it either can happen in meiosis one or meiosis two. This is a non disjunction in meiosis one, shown here. So the homolog failed to separate. What is needed for separation? Kinetic core needs to attach to the centrosome. And the mitochondria, the microtubules must do must be attached to the central centromeres. Oh, I got that backwards. I'm sorry. Kinetic core must be attached to the central centromeres, and the cent the centri kinetic uh, centromere and the inside the uh, kinetic core must be attached to microtubules which must be attached to the central zones. Um, diversity arises how? Crossover and random orientation. Random orientation is called the independence of assortment. Right? Just a reminder. Uh, Non-disjunction in meiosis one and two lead to different results. In meiosis one, homologs fail to separate. In meiosis two, sister chromatids fail to se separate. In meiosis one, non-disjunction will lead to all abnormal gametes. One will have n plus one, the other one have n plus n minus one. So all this gain a chromosome, this lost a chromosome. In meiosis two, it leads to both normal and abnormal gametes. This gain the chromosome. This two, these two are normal gametes. Oh, sorry, this, by the way, this gain a chromosome, this lost the chromosome. Um, euploid is a word that refers to an individual with correct number of chromosomes for their species. In humans, euploidy refers to 22 pairs of autosomes and one pair of sex chromosomes. 
then aneuploid is an individual with an error in chromosome numbers. So monosomy, trisomy are both aneuploidic conditions. Often monosomic zygote will fail to develop because they're missing an entire uh, chromosomes. Some trisomic zygotes will develop to birth. Uh, trisomy 13, 15, 18, 21, 22, but they all suffer genetic imbalance in gene dosage. Um, so, and self, uh, that makes sense because cell functions are calibrated to the amount of gene products produced by two copies, doses of each genes. But adding a third copy disrupts this balance that is required. Now the most common trisomy is the Down syndrome, trisomy 21. And it's correlate, correlated with maternal age with older women being more likely to give birth to fetus with Down syndrome. So if you look at the risk in live birth, after 40, it just skyrockets. This just says that uh, age is associated with increased risk of producing a gamete with abnormal number of chromosomes. Males and uh, females carry different number of XY chromosomes. So because males have XY, females have XX, females lack Y entirely, males lack double dose of the X. So how are we survivable? How are humans survivable? It's because one of the X in females are inactivated. And in female embryos, the one of the X chromosomes inact inactivates by condensing into a bar body. And uh, X chromosome inactivate in each cell during development by random, meaning one that gets inactivated could be from mom, one X from mom, or it could be from the X from dad. And that inactivation occurs randomly. And all cells descending from cell with a particular inactivation pattern will have the same inactivation. So if mom's uh, X is inactivated, all the other cells generated from that particular cell will, will all have that mom's X chromosome inactivated. So this, uh, and genes on bar bodies are not, uh, a bar body are not expressed. So females can compensate for the double dose of genes on X chromosome. An example of that, that is tortoise shell cats. X inactivation is then demonstrated as a coat color variation. variation. Uh, females, cats, heterozygous for X-linked coat color gene will express one of two different coat colors over many different regions of their body. Because each of the dark uh, black or brown brown co uh, color is due to the cell underneath it. And those cells descend from uh, earlier cells in the development. So all tortoise shell cal cats are females. So given the uh, abnormal number of X chromosomes, all but one will inactivate in, in each cell. So X chromosomal anomalies are typically associated with mild disability, but with sterility. If X chromosome is absent entirely, the individual will not, de will not develop. So you can have XO, meaning no Y chromosome, that's called a Turner syndrome. This child will develop into female with short stature and wet skin on, in the neck, uh, cardiac impairment and sterility, but there is no such thing as zero, zero Y, meaning no X and just Y chromosome. That uh, individual will not develop. Then there is the triple, triple X, 
females uh, with three X chromosomes, they'll develop, they'll have developmental delays and re, uh, reduced fertility. And you can also have excess Y. This is called the Klein filter. These are males, with, but with small testes, enlarged breasts, and reduced body hair. So word polyploid refers to an individual with more than correct number of, of uh, chromosomal set, sets. Uh, this can create this can be create a uh, result from abnormal diploid egg and normal haploid sperm, which creates a triploid zygote. Polyploid animals are very rare, but uh, flatworms, crustaceans, amphibians, fish, lizards, and xenopus, wide used used as a a uh, lab frog is uh, uh, tetraploid naturally. Um, triploids are sterile. How do you how do you even divide the odd number? Even you can't. In in order to be uh, reproductively successful, you have to produce viable gametes. But there is no way to produce. Uh, a viable gamete that contains three, that will contain three <laughs> uh, chromosomes once uh, once fertilized. Uh, meiosis cannot proceed normally in triploids, just as I uh, discussed. Uh, polyploid is common in plants. Many of food crops are polyploids, and polyploid plants tend to be larger and more uh, robust than euploids. For instance, rice is 3N, wheat is 4N. Um, some diseases can uh, arise from chromosomal structural rearrangements, and these include things like partial duplication, deletions, inversions, translocations, this actually moving. Uh, duplication and deletions are often lead to survivable disabilities. And the cri du chat stems from deletion of small arm of a segment on chromosome five. And here's a child with cri du chat syndrome at age two, four, nine, and 12. So let's look at some of these re rearrangements. Here's an inversion that's occurring and translocation that can occur. Uh, these can be identified in meiosis because homologue chromosomes with rearrangement in one of the one of the pair must contort. Remember in meiosis, <clears throat> each uh, homologue chromos chromosomes uh, align next to each other precisely with exact same gene lined up next to each other. But if there's an inversion that uh, has to be the the arm of the sister chromatids next to the homolog must contort or change in shape to maintain the proper alignment during the prophase one. So if this if gene order is A, B, C here, and if there was an inversion that occurred here, then this A has to pair with that A, and this B has to be paired with that B. So it has to make a loop. Uh, inversion. Uh, can occur uh, when chromosome detaches and makes a 180 degree rotation, then it reinserts to that part of the chromosome. So inversion occurring here, this is flipping over and attaching to that section. This is flipping over and attaching to that section. And unless, so of course, the sequence is disrupted, inversion only changes the orientation of the gene. And they're likely to have more mild effects than aneuploidic errors or loss of correct number of sets. 
humans have inversion in chromosome, uh, chromosome 18 between ROT1 and USB14, while chimpanzees do not. And that's actually one of 20, 252 inversion locations, both sides. And all the inversions are shown here in green. So all these green dots you see here are inversion locations, both sides. And then you can also have chromosomal uh, segment move to a different place, and that's called the translocation. Now the segment of chromosome dissociates and reattaches to different non-homologous chromosome. And this can have either mild or devastating effects, depending on how genes are altered with respect to regulatory sequences. Reciprocal translocation exchange of segment such that there is no gain or loss of genes. So here's a before translocation. These two segments are trading places and that leads to no gain or no loss of genetic information. And this is likely to very be very mild because Genes that are on this segment is are now on this chromosome. Genes on this segment is now on this chromosome. And they are capable of being expressed normally. If if uh, that's the if they're under proper regulatory sequence. Um, in there are three billion base pairs in human genome, and difference between any two individuals are about 1.1%. That's one in thousand pairs. So shown here are the thousand base pairs. So basically difference is, is that. I just made that uh, picture just to demonstrate what it looks like. So any two individuals will be, will differ by about uh, 6 million base pairs out of 3 billion. Okay, um, I know I haven't uh, gone over the critical thinking questions in previous lectures, but I thought I might start doing that again. Explain the advantage that populations of sexually reproducing organisms have over asexually reproducing organisms. <clears throat> uniqueness? Where does the uniqueness arise? All the gametes are unique from each other. What is What are the sources of such crossing over and uh, independent assortment, and you can also have variations from mutation. Recombination, that's the crossing over, right? Describe two events that are common to sexually reproducing organisms and how they fit into different life cycles of those organisms. Uh, describe, so, so what, what are the ploidy? What does, does it stay the same? for sexually reproducing organisms through different life cycles. Ploidy does cannot stay the same for sexually reproducing organisms throughout the life cycle, right? Because we are diploid organisms, but our gametes are haploid and they have to be haploid. So this has to be maintained. <laughs> Explain how random alignment of homologous, homologous <laughs> chromosomes during metaphase one contributes to, contributes to the variation in gametes produced by meiosis. <clears throat> random alignment refers to the independent assortment. Mom chromosome, mom's chromosome could be on the left or on the right, and dad's chromosome could be vice versa. So that leads to gametes having different combination of maternal and paternal chromosomes. In what ways is meiosis two similar to and different from mitosis of diploid cell? That's you can. I I suggest you look at that uh, uh, summary uh, diagram. 
steps that are drawn on there. Uh, individual with trisomy 21 are likely to survive to adulthood than individual with trisomy 18. Based on what you know about aneuploidy from this module, what can you hypothesize about chromosome 21 and 28, or 21 and 18? 95% of trisomy 2018 uh, do not make it to birth. Well, what can you hypothesize about that? Well, you, that says trisomy 20, uh, chromosome 18 is involved in development of the fetus and embryo to uh, throughout childhood or throughout development. Whereas 21 is not really involved in the development of the fetus or the embryo. Okay, that's all I have today.